We're going to start talking about feeding cover crops, feeding the uh, small grains and why it's all important. And I don't think if, you know, this is one of those preaching to the choir things here, but certainly, uh, you know, this was one of those shot across the bows uh, when the city of Des Moines filed a lawsuit against that uh, river sh watershed and said, you know, we don't like all this nitrate in the water and you're going to do something about it. And, and if you're from Iowa, do you recognize this guy right here? This is our governor. You know, and he'd come up with some ideas, some of them which weren't the most popular, but nonetheless, he was talking about things we need to do, and people were like, oh, this was a surprise. No, it shouldn't have been a surprise. I mean, the handwriting's on the wall, the public's not going to put up with this stuff. And if you don't recognize this, if you ever go to Minnesota State Fair, you know he's standing in front of the DNR building making this talk, and uh, that's a pretty good place to get the crowd you want. <coughs> I now live down here by Caledonia, which is in Houston County, the most southeast county, right on the bend of the Beaver Creek. It goes through our farm, we live in the valley, it's in the Driftless region, and obviously water quality is pretty important to us. There's some of the problems uh, that we can run into when we don't have cover crops and we get heavy rains, tilled fields, and things like that in May. So, cover crop, yeah. You know, this is a non-cash crop grown between two cash crops. And is that the right? I look at it as a feed crop grown between two cash crops that can provide added soil benefits. And we're gonna feed livestock both above and below the ground. So, we got extra value. All right, I'm gonna spend a little time on this uh, slide because you know, small grains we consider, you know, obviously one of the strategies, and Pat's going to talk about uh, cover crops following corn silage and how we work those into getting something out there and might be part of our winter management plan because those things we know can also take up some of that excess nitrogen, stuff like that. Obviously, winter rye, uh, most popular because, you know, that bugger is hardy. I am a big fan of winter triticale, I'll tell you, because back some 35 plus years ago when I was doing my graduate work and feeding triticale, that was when trical and the forest triticales were basically first coming out. And so we did some of those feeding trials at the University of Minnesota, and we were very happy with the way that is when it's managed correctly. Winter wheat can also be a very good one. And triticale, for those who don't remember, it's a cross between wheat and rye. Okay, so you try to get the hardiness of the rye and get the feed quality and the later jointing, basically, of the winter wheat. So the triticale can bring that in, and that's why I like it. Um, but it is not as forgiving as winter rye, uh, as far as we do need to make sure we get that seeding depth Make sure we have an adequate enough time for it to grow before that killing frost. Winter barley, um, not nearly as popular, not nearly as much used, not nearly the varieties and the numbers uh, to pick from. And um, the other thing is, if you do feed or plant some winter barley, one of the things we talk about, you know, is, is that window in the spring when we're going to harvest this stuff. And what's how are we going to hit that just right? And as plants get ready to shoot that seed head, you know we want to harvest in the boot, and that's when that flag leaf is sitting there at the top. And then once that starts uh, shooting up, that you know quality is going to go down pretty fast. And so that is why we look at some of these others because the winter triticale, winter wheat are going to be later in starting that jointing stage compared to winter rye. So we tend to stretch our window a little bit. That's why another reason I like it. Winter barley, if you happen to do that, is a little more comparable to rye. And then the other ones, you know, spring oats or fall oats when we plant those. One of the things about planting oats, spring oats in the spring, it's growing and it increasingly gets longer days and warmer weather. And so that's a bigger struggle to get high quality forage but we've been doing it, my family's been doing the 
harvesting small grains, mostly oats, uh, for about 50 years. And uh, I remember, I was about 10 years old, some University of Minnesota research came out that talked about harvesting in the boot stage. And I remember actually it was a, one of those after church Sunday mornings you kind of stand around talking. And I remember my cousin said, did you see that article in the farm? We're supposed to harvest in the boot stage. And that was some early work of George Marks, who was a colleague that was almost my age when I started grad school. So, you know, it was a little while ago. By the way, Lee Johnson's going to talk this afternoon. I just have to get this in because I already told Cerise that. I remember when we hired him back in the day. So, we've been around a little while, but he is a good addition. All right, let's talk about some other things. Obviously, here's what we're really talking about a lot. Corn silage, follow with winter rye, winter tree kingly. You know, one of the things I stress to people is don't tell me it won't work. Tell me what we need to do to make it work. And I'm guessing Pat's going to talk about, you know, get corn silage off. We've got to get that 30-foot drill out there and roll through. But do we have manure we're going to put on? Are we going to put it on before? Are we going to put it on after we seed? How's it all going to work out? Another option to look at this is last year alfalfa, and maybe by third cut, are you gonna take a fourth cut? Well, we always just kind of assume that we're going to do that. But when you look at a dry matter yield, maybe if we go in there, we got third cutting come off this week. Let's go and put some manure on, we got a little window, and we'll plant some spring oats in the fall or potentially at something else, depending on the weather, and Mary's gonna talk a little bit about that too. You know, we do have some gambles. Is it gonna be a warm, long fall or whatever? But I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that can fit as well. Um, and then maybe we, the other thing would be <coughs> alfalfa, just take the first crut, put on corn silage, come back up here, whatever. So basically, I think about kind of a 3-2 system where we're increasing the number of harvests that we get of forage in two years, three harvests. Or maybe even we start doing a triple cropping, three crops in the same year. Harvest, corn silage, plant, we have crops. You know, maybe not harvesting, but we're growing three crops, even in Minnesota. Here's what I was just alluding to a little bit. How about how a spring oat, and Mary and I were talking about this before, and it's kind of, uh, you might have to play around a little bit. I like to go in Minnesota with a fairly early spring oat and plant it after August 15th, but not, not much later. All right, gonna try to hit that window and maybe in that alfalfa situation. But because it's a spring plant, it normally is used to warmer weather, and longer days. And when we don't have the longer days, we physiologically fool that oak plant. And when we do that, we get an amazing low lignin, kind of the similar NDF, but we can have high sugar levels because with the days getting shorter, the plant, uh, a spring oak, is telling itself, I gotta shoot a seed head, I gotta shoot a seed head, reproduction, that's what it's about. So it's accumulating these sugars. But the day length keeps getting shorter and the plant goes, do I put a sheet head out? I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And so it accumulates sugars, low lignin, NDF. It's some pretty good forage. So something to think about uh, in uh, lots of feeding situations. Not a new concept. 1910, the old uh, little one horse drill comes through. People were planting winter wheat in their standing corn, 40 inch rows, 42 inch rows, whatever. And they knew they needed to get their winter wheat in before they were going to run out of uh, uh, time to get it done. And so they went and had planted that winter wheat. It was sprouting and a month later or, or more, they, they were still hand husking that corn, but the winter wheat was starting. So it, uh, something interceding and whatever has been working for a long time. Okay, now we're gonna get a little science. Borderline uh, boring, but anyway, NDF. 
NDF is kind of the fundamental thing about forage. It's the digestible fiber of some varying degrees, and you know we can talk about all kinds of analytics and all that stuff. But NDF, you know, it's the cell wall. It's what makes the plant a plant standing up. It's made up of pectin, hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. Very 100% digestible, basically. Pectin is your jams, by the way, in case you had some pectin this morning. Uh, hemicellulose, very digestible. Cellulose, pretty digestible with enough time if it's not blocked by lignin. And so we think about cellulose is made up of glucose units. Starch is made up of glucose units. The only difference is how they're bonded. And usually I bring some Lego blocks that uh, I can show how the bonds are different and that makes all the difference in the world. The starch gets into the rumen, boom, 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 very fast, can be risky. Cellulose a little slower, but it's made up all these little glucose units and beta 1,6 and alpha 1,4 sweet starch and cellulose. We can go on and on and bore you very quickly. But basically, NDF is a neutral detergent solution. When we're doing that, we're trying to get the stuff out of the cell wall and measure what's left. And when it's immature, it's not very thick, not a lot of lignin. As it gets older, it develops secondary wall, a lot of cross-linking and all that stuff. And basically where that lignin is, it's blocking digestion of the cellulose. And that's why we like low lignin alfalfa varieties, immature because it's lower in lignin, those kind of things. And the interesting thing about small grains is that it's a cool season crop and they tend to be lower in lignin. It's a grass, not a legume like alfalfa. Like grasses are always about half, at the same maturity, it's about half as much lignin. Probial access grasses. Yeah. So Jim, what do you mean they use the term block by lignin? I mean they're... Yeah, it's basically, think, think about lignin bonding in there and stuff, mm -hmm. and where lignin is there, it's almost like, uh, you might say like a shellac or something. Basically, you don't get microbial access to digest the fiber. Okay. Yep. And so, and that also causes problems because, okay, we're not digesting as much, we're not digesting as fast, and the rumen fills up. And so if you ate some really coarse green beans, sometimes, you know, I remember on the farm, the green beans got a little mature, we still ate them off the garden. Or alfalfa sprouts, which would be, you know, in your salads now, pretty digestible things like that. So that's the difference between this and this, or whatever. And the alfalfa sprouts, think about like this, you don't go out and cut yourself a little alfalfa out of the hayfield to eat, do you, for your salads? Mm, pretty chewy. Mm. All right, let's keep going. So think about NDF as the structural types of thing. If you opened up all the windows and all the doors and all the stuff that was in the room could run out, that's what we do with an NDF solution, an ND, neutral detergent solution and what you're left is that hollow kind of a structure and depending on how mature your plant is your whatever forage is how much mortar and brick and re-rod and all that's in there and how much it can digest and how much it fills up you know this is more mature than this one but how fast it crumbles down in the room so ndf is very important and it is important now amount of NDF and then the digestibility at the end. Okay. And NDF digests fast, digests slow. So on alfalfa, this is pretty clear. What's the fast stuff in alfalfa digestion? Basically the leaves is gonna be fast, but you get the pectins and the sugars and all that stuff coming out of the cells and all that. And then it kind of slows down, and over here, some of that's not digested at all. What's left there? Stems, okay? And corn silage, a little different, tends to be a little more of an angle, a little more tall, but corn silage is a warm season grass. Orchard grass or cereal grains are cool season grasses. So they're a little different. And you'll see some more, I'm gonna show you uh, 
how that works. <coughs> and that's important to think about any time we're feeding cows, whether it's beef or dairy, young or old, is how much NDF and then how digestible it is. Because that rumen's kind of like a factory. Things are only going to move through so fast. You have a slow factory or a faster factory. Here is some just widely publicized research done by a young researcher. I just was, you know, come on, bring it on, I'm on, yeah, I know. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and then there's George Marks, who was, like I said, kind of a predecessor. He did a lot of small grain stuff. He was up at Crookston, and uh, we did some of this stuff out at Rosemont and things. Basically, these diets were simple. 50-50 forage concentrate. Okay? We had some different ones. Notice the NDFs, again, grasses, small grains are almost higher, almost always higher in NDF as compared to alfalfa. Okay? But we don't show it here, but because they're lower in lignin, they are going to be more digestible NDF. Here's the crude proteins. And again, this was a spring planted oat. This was a winter triticale. And then we, we harvested that on, on Memorial Day weekend. And we went out on Saturday, started chopping, chopped a load or two, put it in the bag. The bag was just sagging. It's like, I think we're a little wet. We better come back on Monday. So Memorial Day in 19, early 80s, whatever it was, <laughs> we were harvesting critically. But the milk production, notice, how the triticale compared very well with the alfalfa back then. That was somewhat of a surprise to us, uh, but we were really pleased and went on to do quite a bit more stuff. Heifers and dry cows can also work into that. High forage diets, moderate energy. We're gonna look at some other things, of the minerals and stuff, but again, we have that window, and we run into it with cereal rye probably a little bit more, where we maybe won't have milk, qual qual milk cow quality, but they are still good quality, and we can almost always use a forage somewhere on the farm. So here is some of the minerals on these same, uh, on the triticale compared to alfalfa. We know here's calcium at 0.4, you know, Alfalfa is probably going to be 1.4, uh, phosphorus 0.42, probably pretty similar. Uh, here's something, grasses and cereal grains can be luxury accumulators of potassium. And if we're going to put it into dry cow diets, we better watch that because we do not want potassium levels over 1.5. I like 1.25 probably for dry cow diets. So we've got to watch that. But, again, combining with some corn silage might be a possibility. Jim, what's the concern with the high potassium? Oh, high potassium in dry cow diets, of course, we just set them up for some milk fevers in, uh, when we have too high of potassium levels. We think about low calcium, and back when I was first starting grad school, and even growing up on the dairy farm, we always like, oh, low, low calcium diets and stuff. Well, that was part of it, this phosphorus, potassium, and we can do all sorts of things. Are you guys feeding decads? Oh, huh? that would be interesting to hear that. So, um, all right, here's some more recent stuff. Down at Penn State here just a couple of years ago, um, they fed either winter wheat, winter triticale compared to some corn silage or added to corn silage. They also did some forage sorghums and they did some fall growing oat silage. They fed 12 cows and they, but basically, this is not a great amount. We're only putting 10% dry matter of that forage. But I want to show you something about how that can actually work. So here is the composition of the forages. They have two, they had two different corn silages. And NDFs pretty similar. Notice NDFs. These are good NDFs. Um, and you'll notice the sorghum, they, they harvested all, both of those at 60 days. 
you let sorghum go that long and you're going to have some fairly high NDF. It mm, doesn't excite me that much. Uh, these are lower uh, lignin contents. Again, alfalfa would be about twice as high. Here's something though. Notice the starch contents on the corn silages and the starch contents, I mean hardly any starch at all in those small grains. Ah, uh, what's the perfect combination for that? Some corn silage, some small grain, feed it to heifers, feed it to dry cows, don't get too fat, not too much energy. So that's one way we can make those work. And Jim, on that previous sign, you had 9% sugar. Mm -hmm. you know, oh. Uh, oh, let's see, where, where are we going? Right. One more? Yeah, one more. Right, right. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yes, I'm glad you pointed out because I skipped over that. Um, one of the things about grasses over legumes too is that they do um, are higher in, gra higher in sugars. And forages in general of legumes and grasses are going to be low starch. Um, this was interesting in that we did have 9.35% um, sugars. And so there is some more sugar in grasses and small grains prior to boot stage or at boot stage compared to at the head. And then your starches are going to be low too. Yeah. So there, there were fructans in grasses than in legumes, right? What, what does that do in the dairy gut? Well, one thing, um, sugars are actually very beneficial. They, they're a rapid source of energy for uh, microbes. And when we have soluble proteins coming in, you need to have two things that are running the race together. And they are very good at that. You know, sometimes we like to have lactating cow diets, five, six percent sugars. And so we can get some from the forages. Uh, you know, another alternative is they're adding liquid molasses and things like that. But if we can bring it in with um, some of the forages, again, you know, the counter argument to that, since I do have horses also, um, you don't want to have too much sugars in those early spring grasses and pastures. Horses can get laminitis because it's too much. But then again, they're a different kind of animal. Okay, keep moving on here. Here are some of the, again, milk production. Mm, maybe this higher corn silage diet produced a little more milk. Um, one of the things in these diets, um, they did not have what I would call a good clicking on the microbial protein production there. Those are pretty low milk proteins. I'm guessing Pat would be not real happy with his nutritionist if he was getting less than 3% or 3.1 milk proteins. The other thing I want to show, there's, this is some of those same kind of digestion things that were shown before. But notice whether these two high digestible NDF disappearance in percent of NDF per hour. And a lot of times we look at like 30 hour NDF digestibility in lactating cows because a lot of dry matter intake, we need to turn over that rumen factory fairly fast. And so we like to see greater rates of digestion. We get some early alfalfas, uh, 30 hour, in, and then we're going to stall that out. Corn silage. Corn silage has always been a little slower out of the gate digesting that NDF. Again, because it's a warm season grass. And here is that fall planted oat silage. Again, really high, even at the 30 hour. You know, we like to get up, we like to have that whole diet NDFD of about 50% for all your forages. And one of the things you know they talk about good corn silage has a lot of grain in it. Well why is that? Well because we get a little more performance because the NDF is not that fast. So sometimes we make up for it but really what we want is that corn silage to have good NDF digestibility as well and not rely on it. Otherwise we're just pouring grain into it. So that Again, we could have some stuff that gets pretty mature. Here is a sample from last fall, actually. Uh, and this got to be pretty mature, and it did not have really great uh, total tract digestibility. It's slower, we look at K 
KD is the digestion constant. We can get all kinds of science in there. But yeah, Jim, define pretty mature. Uh, that was stuff that we didn't get to in time in the spring. It was all headed out, and probably two weeks after it's headed out before we got a job. Yeah, that was like, it's wet, we can't do anything about it. I'm never doing this again. Like milk stage, dough stage. Uh, <laughs> good, good dough stage, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, hmm. And so, yeah, we lose some stuff, but yet we still have ways to use it. And like I said, good dilution with corn silage. This is what the hills look like around our area. And I mean, we are all no-till and things like that. And I just get so upset in our county when I see, you know, there's 160 acres. And you can see what the terrain is like. So on 160 acres, you might have 100 till. And they come in and they put the whole thing in the soybeans. And it just burns me to no end. So, again, we can always find ways to use it if you have livestock in your system. And you can see we had high NDF, we had low protein. But we can do that. This was, again, compared to a 60 day average of triticale uh, that was sampled by Dairyland Labs or Rock River. Can't remember which one it was. Um, you know, on the average, NDFs for triticale are going to be pretty decent. Proteins are going to be around 14. Even on a four year average, they're around 13 something and around 54 NDF. We keep getting better. Those averages, I think, will keep coming down. Now, is that salvage or hay? That could be anything that comes in and says triticale. So, most likely silage or damage. So, when you say as we get better, is that management? Management, harvest, and a little lot too. But I think we gotta gear up to be ready to hit that when it's ready, and then hope the weather gives us. And that's why you know silage or baleage. You know we can't wait for that seven o'clock. We gotta get it off. So, and the other thing, one of the things we can utilize in these cover crops is potential forage chain into later and. Certainly Kent has done a lot with this, uh, different ways, and Mary's gonna talk some more about that as well, whether it's beef or dairy or whatever. Uh, so here's a couple things here. You know, boot stage for dairy quality. Oh, well, maybe we don't need milk quality, but you know, we kind of the, and have the forge tested. Test, don't guess. Uh, and, uh, it's surprising how many people still aren't testing forages as much uh, and, you know, we can make these diets work 10%, up to 50%, certainly in lactating cows. The other thing, and Pat and Harley will talk about this too, we got to wash those moisture level, can't let it get too dry, too mature. Well, that stuff gets really springy, whether it's bagging or bunkers or whatever, uh, trying to get that packing. And I have seen some honking big tractors on 12-foot bags trying to pack his silage and, and uh, it's amazing you see the tractor just rocking. So what chop length are you recommending? I recommend no longer than three quarter. Theoretical. Yeah. Regardless of maturity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, small grains is not where I want to try to get my forage part of the length because we need to get that in the pack. And the other thing is when we shop a little shorter, we speed up that digestion of any effluent. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. What about baleage on small grains? Baleage on small grains? That you have to know that you're not chopping enough. Oh, you know, I'm probably not going to try to put that into dairy cow diets, if milking cow diets, if I do, unless you want to just crank her in the vertical a little bit. But you, yeah, you will slow it down a little bit. Um, but there's certainly lots of ways in, you know, I've watched cows don't have anything else to do, just sit and watch your cows eat. And you can learn a lot <laughs> of doing that. But yeah, anyway. this is, and again, I think I'm going to get off here pretty quick, but Mary's going to talk about it. And there are times a year you plant some things, and there are times a year you plant other things because at some times a year, this stuff was planted October 20th or August 25th, <laughs> and here we are um, 60 days later. 
And you can see, yes, this actually was all planted, this stuff. And there are things that do not grow when it gets cold. And so we uh, have some, here's some forage oats, and here's some kale, and grape, and radishes, and whatever, different things. But well, you can see here too, some stay, stay green, some not. So certainly work with advisors or consultants or whatever on what you want to put in and when. And you know, cover crops, diversity, plant depth, plant types, do all kinds of things. You can do that. I think I'm gonna get out of the way. Not a lot of questions, but Pat, it's up to you. Yeah. So we get much North Caledonia survival of the triticale over winter gets to be ah. questionable at times. Yeah. One of the things I have found, and we we had pretty good even at Rosemont, that stuff you need to have that inch and a half to two inches deep when you plant it. That had a big determination. Big determination. Survival. Yeah. Uh, and you shallow half inch or whatever you come up and it always would freeze out. And then latest planting depth per day. Triticale. Mm, yeah. Too late. Too late, I think. September 15th. September 15th. Yep. Throughout yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. Yep. I would not plant triticale after September 15th and expect to have good survival, even if I got it in deep enough. But one of the things I found that depth really seemed to make much more of a difference than it does in the winter ride. So, so inch, inch, inch and a half. Inch and a half to two. Inch and a half to two. Yeah. So that date, that September 15th, that's for northern Minnesota, or is that for southern? That's Southern Minnesota too, because I want to make sure I get that much growth. Yeah. Yeah, see you Nebraska people. You know, I love it. I read these our cover crop stuff, you know, Indiana, Ohio. We're doing this, we're doing this. Well, yeah, you're about 500 miles south of us. We're, we're not quite as No. Easy. We don't get it as easy as they do either, but yeah. But your winters are more mild. We could go to October 1st, yeah. probably. So this is an aside, but what's, a, what's the significance of the difference between an NDF for 30 hours and 38 hours? Oh, see those reported yeah, that's a very good question. So, I personally am a 30 hour fan because what's the average time that most forages are in the cow's rumen? Oh, about 30 hours. Some are going to be faster, some are going to be slower. 48 in dairy cows with dairy cow intake. And we're talking 50, 55, 60 pounds of dry matter intake. You got your beef cows out there, 25 pounds of dry matter intake, could do a 48. They got forever. Exactly. That's, I mean, I think the biggest difference. If I was shooting for dairy, I'd do 30. If I'm shooting for beef, I'd do 48. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't say that 48 is kind of false to the best, actually. Yeah, it does vary. And dry matter intake is a big factor. And, and the dairy cow, a high producing dairy cow, she's got to move that stuff through the factory. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Jim. Good morning. My, my name is Patrick Jones. I'm going to talk this morning how we seed, harvest, and feed winter rye on our dairy operation in Northwest Iowa. It's a little bit south of where Jim's talking about, but we get some really cold winter temperatures. My family and I, my wife and I, and our two adult children run a thousand cow Jersey dairy near Spencer in Northwest Iowa. We've been seeding winter rye for forage silage harvests for about 15 years. So we've kind of done some do's and don'ts throughout the years and, and now we're using winter rye more as a, a feed or a silage. Last year we seeded 900 acres with uh, cover crops. So we went out and we killed quite a bit of it. We kept the best for harvest for silage for our our dairy here. We've kind of increased our our number of acres over the years. We've increased our herd and we're using a little more feed as time goes on. Just a little overview of what I'm going to talk about. This is what our site looks like. I'm going to talk about seeding, harvest, feeding, and then maybe some planting of other crops uh, following the winter rye harvest in the spring. And uh, we feed it now mostly to young stock, but we have, as Jim's talk, we've used early harvest and fed that to milking animals as well. And that's how we time our harvest, is what feed do we want? Do we want a, a milking cow feed to stretch our silage or our alfalfa haylage? 
storage? Or do they want heifer dry cow feed? So we'll time that. So let's talk about seeding. We've seeded two different ways over the years, but as Jim talked, we seed as soon as we can after silage harvest. When that silage chopper is in the field, normally we're seeding in the same field. And in our part of the country, Northwest Iowa, that's the first two weeks of September. And it does yield the best product in the spring is if you get that early season growth in September, if you can do that. So we've seeded for many years using broadcast seeding, just rented a fertilizer hoppy from the local co-op. We seeded two bushel an acre broadcast. We came back and we would use the tools we had on hand, a light tandem disting or a soil finisher, always followed by a roller. This is a low cost option, uh, it's tools you have on hand, it's quick. Uh, the seed depth is variable. It would depend on, say, your soil conditions, dry, wet at the time. So one thing you're looking for in this is to get a smooth seed bed. You want, you want to have, if there's any ruts left, from your, say, silage harvest. Sometimes it's, it's wet and you're chopping anyway. You've got truck tracks, you've got wagon tracks. This operation will level some of them out because we have to remember we're coming back in the spring and we're gonna harvest this. And we, we don't want all this, this really rough seed bed. So maybe this is desired at some time to come in and fix some mistakes we've had during the, the fall harvest. Not the perfect seed depth, you get a varying seed depth, so maybe it isn't quite optimum for the actual plant production. As we've moved through the years, we've purchased a no-till drill. That allows us to cut our seeding rate from two bushel down to one and a half. We think we get a much better seed placement. It gets at that inch, inch and a half, gets it down there. We can utilize our seed better. We get a faster, more even germination. This is a picture of, of probably a, a 30 day, 45 day seeding. You can see you've still got your your corn butts are still standing in the field yet, and that's what we're after. We, we, don't, we want to do the least disturbance as we can. So we like this better if we haven't torn the field up with the silage chopper. Now, if you've torn it to pieces, you're not going to like this quite as well. You're going to have to do a little bit to fix it. But this is a fast thing. We leave the root balls intact, and when we choose our fields for harvest, for winter rye, we're in an area where we're flat. We don't have quite the rolling ground, and we'll have field with potholes in it, just low areas that, that we farm just fine, but in the winter or early spring, they'll collect water, and that'll smother that rye right out. So you have to be kind of careful. Have a well-drained field, if you're planning on harvesting that, because it's no fun to go out and have five acres out of the 80 acres or, or, or drown it out. So we ch choose our fields, try to have the right fields for the right, the right thing. Switching to spring, we always talk about two harvest options in that one is an early harvest option and that's like Jim talked, that's your higher quality feed. In the mid-May, in our neck of the woods, we've cut a lot of years in that 15th to 17th of May. We're out there, we're cutting in the boot stage, and we have a, a nice high quality product. 13% protein, we can feed that to milk cows, mix it right in with, if we're short on alfalfa, haylage. And 
this has great feed quality. It brings in some concerns as far as agronomic in that the ground's still wet. It's almost muddy under there. So when you cut this and you lay it down on wet ground, it'll take two or three days even to get it to dry to a 65% moisture. It's a high leaf to stem ratio product. It has a lot of leaves to it, not much stem. It dries a little slower. So you pull in, like Jim said, with the chopper, and whoa, it's 73%. <laughs> you better wait. So this will be a little slower. It's a little bit concerned. You can almost see on the, on the tractor and the tire, it's wet. But you're you end up with a good prop. You're running duels on that. You're running duels. <laughs> are you, how wide a windrow are you trying to? This, this windrow is a 15 footer. Okay. And then we put it down to a nine foot. Okay. So we dry a little faster. This is showing maybe an early harvest. It's about a three foot. You can kind of see no heads. Your, yep. your flag, flag leaf, leaf. Yep. see? This is what you're doing, and uh, so this is your early harvest, and it works well. We've gone to, we've gone to a, this is showing your, we'll bring those uh, ring rows and we'll merge them for these larger choppers. We'll put them wide to dry. This year, for the first year, we've come with a, not a mower conditioner. We're using actually just a disc mower, a 20 foot disc mower, and it lays it 17 feet wide. So it's just like you went out with a mower. Yes. So you're merging both early and late harvest or just late? We're merging both. both. But you are, we are a little mindful because on a late harvest, when you get crops that are this tall, fully headed, you've got a lot of tons an acre. Early harvest will go two ton an acre. Late harvest, all of a sudden we've got three ton an acre. So we're a little careful on how much we actually do merge in a red crop. The choppers are big, but they can only pick up a lot. It picks up kind of hard. It's not like alfalfa. It, it's its own thing. Because of the hollow stem, it stays separate. Your pickups need to be pretty good. You need to have pretty good equipment. I like that you're doing the non-cripping. I really think with small grains, seeing some of those, I'm not sure cripping conditioning does anything for help us dry faster. Well, we've gone to that. Like I say, this is our first year we wanted to, and we've gone to the non-crimping for the rye, and then we harvest 200 acres of alfalfa for dairy quality and haylage also. <clears throat> we're going to a, this is off, not on the charge, but we're going to alfalfa, we're going to the harv extra, the low lignin, so we can reduce our alfalfa cuttings from five cuttings a year to four. When you do that, you get a higher tonnage per cutting, so then you you need to lay it wider, thinner, so the drying time is better. We've gone to the hay in the day where we'll cut in the morning. We'll cut alfalfa from seven to eleven in the morning, merge from three to five, and chop from five to seven, and it's sixty percent moisture. But it takes the right equipment. And I'm of the opinion that the, the first moisture out of alfalfa coming out doesn't come out by the benefit of the crimping. It comes out respiration yep. through yes. the leaves. And we, we have seen that firsthand in that then the leaves and the plant stays more intact when we try to merge it and handle it just to get it chopped, then it stays together better. If we crimp that, we tend to damage it. Even though we're rubber crimping, we damage it. 
And I think the same thing's true here. You're, you're not damaging that problem. So, clearly, you think you gain more from the hand of the day than waiting to cut the afternoon when sugar content's higher. Yes, yes, we, we do. We actually, though, we modify, we, we gain more from the hand of the day. It's, and it's from a two part deal in that hay in a day, if you're going to do that, then you're laying it thin. You're laying the alfalfa or the crop so that none's laying on top of the other, or, the, or less than 80%, or 80% coverage. That gives an even drying for the crop. Then when you've got 60% moisture product in the bunker, then you've got more of it that's actually 60%. You don't have some that's 40 and some that's 70. Because then when you put it in your bunker, it ferments, you take it out, you've still got that 70% portion that you averaged out, but the cow eats that. That's higher potential of clostridium right there. And that's, that's where you get more even with your hay in the day. We modify it some in our early spring. We'll actually cut alfalfa at n in the night. Uh, I mean, say six to nine at night. So it gets very little drying, I mean, sun on it. Then the next morning, as soon as the dew's off, we're gone. We're ready to go. So we kind of use that. Because at times with your high humidity levels in our areas, the hay in a day doesn't quite work. See what I mean? So this is our late harvest on rye. Uh, like we were talking, rather than being a 13% protein, it's a 9 to 11. I've got feed tests with me that we took this spring. We had a three ton yield, it was 10.4% protein. I had no intention of feeding it to milking cows because I have replacements and dry cows that I planned it for. And that, that's where it's going. Uh, it's a different situation. You wouldn't think it's late May chop. Uh, the ground conditions are solid. The rye has grown that extra ton, it's taking the moisture out of the soil. Everything's pretty dry underfoot. Uh, it's good to go. But you gotta have a need for that feed if you wanna let it go that far. Storage, we put it in bunkers and we do follow. We, we go with a half inch particle size cut. When it gets that late cut, we crank it down. We're, we're not or not for long part the length on that. Get it short, you can get it packed. That is a challenge when you try to start driving on this with tractors. You think you're pretty good at packing silage, you have the best tractor and it's all gonna work. And it's just barely tolerable. You, you pack it. The nice thing about rye is that it's very forgiving. When you think you've got it packed and it's it's not a good job, it's spongy, you know you've trapped air in there, but rye as a insulin product is very forgiving. There's very low starch. It's not there to create the molds to cause you trouble. It doesn't come out and cause you trouble. It seems like it always feeds well, even though it doesn't appear to be packed. Just cover it good. Following rye harvest, we really got a couple choices and it, it tends to follow how you harvest it. Did you harvest early, mid-May? Then you're looking good. You're, you can still put in some corn. We've done it for years. We planted corn following rye. Come back and harvested that as early, time moisture early to our corn silage. And as later years, we put no-till beans in there, come back and put no-till beans in in mid-May. They'll deal right with conventional beans as far as a cash crop. We've got options as far as doing tillage or no tillage. 
a lot of times we needed a place for liquid manure and we would right after rye harvest we'd come in and we'd get one last chance to lower some storage pits of liquid manure put that on then do a couple tillage passes and put corn in there it can be a challenge when you work up this rye sod in the spring because a few days before it was a living plant and now you tore it up and you're going to have rye root balls. It's going to be a little challenge. But usually the weather, you usually get a rain that comes along and it's fine. On a no-till situation, it just takes a pretty good planter, get the corn poked down in, and uh, and you'll have to spray it. A little rye will come back. Not bad, but some will come back. Keep enough nitrogen on there because as that rye decomposes, it's going to use up the nitrogen and steal it from the small corn. And if you have sod like this or have some residue, then it's a perfect haven for wire worms or cut worms once the corn's about like that. So just kind of keep your eye on it. They'll, they'll come in. When all the other fields in the area are probably clean till, tilled, then they'll like this, you know, if you get the right weather conditions. So feeding rye, like I say, we kind of choose what we, where we want to feed the rye, and that makes a determination of where we cut it, when we cut it. And uh, a lot of times we use it in growing heifer, rations and uh, dry cow rations. I think our, our dry cow rations now have about 36% dry matter for their daily ration is, is rye silage, where on growing heifers we're in that 21 to 26% dry matter is what there is. So we're using it and then balance it with corn silage and we use a, a wet distillers to provide protein in there and kind of go with the ration. <coughs> Pretty cheap, cheap ration for us. So I kind of did some costs and returns uh, to try to make it so that it, is this a doable thing? It, is this, am I paying myself uh, or should I be using some other kind of feed? So we used a 750 bushel seed cost and we drilled it in and used a, a, just a custom rate drilling charge. And by the time we get a bushel and a half drilled in, it was 28, 15 an acre. And if the spring, if we use a custom rate again for our mower and conditioning and for our chop hauling and pack, we got 90, almost $95 an acre on our spring cost. So we got a pretty hefty dollars per acre cost and uh, but if we if we took three ton dry matter off of that then it really costs us about forty one dollars a ton for that feed. Now if I didn't have that rye silage I would probably use a good grass hay. I would either have to buy it or or a market cost and I've checked on some local auctions lately and uh, grass hay is in that 90 to 120 dollar ton right now so that's what we would have to use so we think we're probably paying ourselves for doing the the rye and we're still getting good crops you know behind it and we're getting feed that we need in that we can't we have plenty of corn silage but we can't feed too much corn silage to these replacement animals. We just can't do it. And, uh, so in conclusion, our pros and cons, we've got some early spring feed, and it's a versatile feed too. We can, we can choose to harvest it for milk cows, we can let it go for young cows, dry cows. Uh, it's the right thing to do for our soil protection. protection. We've got uh, a lot of acres with something growing on it right after silage harvest. For us, 
it works in an off-season storage option in our bunkers. We, we get those filled in the fall with, say, corn silage, with yearlings, with haylage, we're, we're full by spring. We've got some room that we fed out, and we can come right back in. We can fill one of those bunkers that's empty with, with rye silage, feed it through the summer or into fall, and all of a sudden it's opened up again for another feed. We don't have to have extra bunkers. And the same thing with manure. It gives us a, an option for a late spring manure application. And we do think it, it pays for our, our time. The cons, yes, the seeding and the harvest of the winter rye or winter tricale are right when you're busy doing everything else. You're chopping corn silage and you gotta have somebody seeding rye right behind it. And the same thing in the spring. You're trying to plant corn or or getting ready to harvest alfalfa. And here you got this rye that, that a day or two makes a ton of difference on its maturity. You gotta do it like right now. And, but it takes good equipment, and in the spring it can be a challenge. It can continue to rain, and, and you pack the field, but that's, that's kind of the way it goes. So you're saying the compactions from the extra traffic, the traffic. extra equipment traffic. You can get that. And we feel that's a little more of a concern on this early harvest, when we're going in there in, in mid-May. And, uh, in fact, the, the the more conditioner you saw there, we put fenders on. You know, we, we put mud fenders so that when I saw it, it didn't throw mud up on the crop or on the windrow. So, yes. So did you have to add labor when you started doing this? Did you hire more labor? No, we used our labor, you know, because we, we actually, in our operation, we have labor that we can use for these harvesting operations. For corn, for silage harvest, for alfalfa harvest, we have that labor and that equipment. So it worked well. It works well in our situation in that we just use our same equipment, labor, and they're good. I mean, we have the trucks for the drivers, the packing, everything is good. The people just don't like the rye as well, to be honest, because it doesn't pack good and. It's, we always have said rye is the right moisture to chop for 10 minutes. That's it. It's either too wet or it's too dry. That's an extreme, but so, and that's you're trying, good. you're trying to get 60% for rye as well? 60% 60 to 60, 65% moisture is what we would like. But we err on the wet side for rye because then you, you get a better packing product. It doesn't run from the silo. It doesn't hinder its insulin at 70% moisture. You would think it would, but it, it doesn't. Where dry, <coughs> then, then it's really hard to pack, really hard to chop something, but it still does insulin. We've done it the whole gamut over 15 years. I know we've had less than 50% product, and we've I've got feed tests with 72%, and they feed well. So it's just, you can't do that with haylage. I mean, you're not going to get away with that. Murder, or you can just get away with murder with rye. You just can't. It just, it's tough. From a feeding and storage standpoint. And the animals, the, they adjust to it, and then it's just fine. It's just, it really feeds well. But you just can't get away with that in the corn silage either. You, you can't do that. You know, you get caught. So, well, that, that's what I got. Thank you. Yes? Do, do you think that the rye roots uh, will compensate for some of the compaction in, in the next year? Yes, yes. I think they alleviate. Because they do grow really deep. They do really deep. And I think. We feel like if we really, you know, are, are seem like we're hard on that field doing our harvest of our rye, it's probably not as bad as it seems because those roots are in there and they will die and then they leave those open in 
channels. So it is better. And your field is more, it's just firmer with those rye roots, that, that sod base. You can even imagine how it is. You know, you get an inch of rain in the spring or, or two and and your, your field that's worked, you wouldn't think about going in that to spray. And you'll drive in the rye field after dinner and, and spray it, you know, or whatever, because it's, and you won't damage it. Yeah. Like we have peas to oats, do you think you'd benefit from adding the carry vetch to that rye? Adding here, here, here vetch? And then leaving, leaving it? Leaving it and, and then? Just harvesting it together. Oh, yes. We have a field that uh, a couple years ago that by mistake uh, wasn't hairy vetch, it was a crown vetch. Is that one that gets kind of tall? Well, they both get kind of tall and fine. Yeah, kind of fine. this was in the seed and and by mistake, but it, and it came in the spring. So I was a little weary, but it, it was fun. So it have a pink flower? Or pink yeah, flower? pink flower. Pink flower. Yep, yep, and it came. So it was fine. Yeah. So you've talked about using primarily rye after corn silage, um, but you've talked about even some other options in trip or follow yep. or follow. Can you follow through an extended rotation where you would use rye in that rotation, like three, four, or five years out? How would rye fit into that in your bigger rotation? You know, a longer ro yeah. term rotation. Yeah. How do you how do you do it? Are you gonna do a cereal rye, corn for corn silage? Or you, I mean your corn that you follow rye is all of them you got in for corn silage? It can corn silage or earlage or in a cash crop situation then you've got a cash crop swing. We have done a follow the rye harvest with forage soybean sorghum combo. And then that was a fall forage that was really a nice product here. So do you typically go corn silage, rye, back to corn silage or beans? Yeah. Then yep. back to rye again? No. Then then yes, we, we would we would get rye again as a cover crop. As a cover crop. Or it could be harvested again. But we're the three two that Jim talks. Oh yeah. We're the three crops, two years yep. is what okay. we like. Yep. Okay. And then every acre that we farm after harvest gets a cover crop. They might not all survive, right. but they and are that's all. that's not all bad either. Well, they might not all survive because in our neck of the woods, the the our September fifteenth, just like Jim said, that's the optimal date. Get it in by September fifteenth, and for us to have a cover crop survive needs to be in by October 15th. And the late, as you get closer to that October 15th, you need to more, in our area, move more towards winter rock. Quit trying the others. Yeah, you can try the others until, because winter rye is just an anything. You know, it's just, We've had it years, and you've probably seen it. We had a uh, field last year. In fact, we were chopping the corn silage, and I was in the field seeding behind it with a broadcast seeder. And I broadcast up to the chopper, went home, got the incorporation tool, and got it half incorporated. I actually was using GPS and was doing strips, 30-foot strips. I got half done, was turning on, going back, had a downpour. I actually had over three inches of rain. I was done. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was out. I couldn't go back because some might have sprouted. Three weeks, you couldn't tell the difference where I went and where I didn't incorporate. It all came. And, yeah, and that, the three inch rain. Yeah, the three inch rain three was the key there because you pounded it in. It pounded it in, <laughs> but it came. So rye is, is your savior. Is it easy? Yeah. We would, we've used tr triticale. We have better feed, like Jim says, but you want that in that mid September time. And I think you want to drill that. Yeah, absolutely. So you want to do all those things, then it works. 
And in the spring, Jim, when you cut triticale, you want a dismal because it has a lot of leaves and it tillers and it has leaves at the surface. I've done it years before I had a disc mower with a sickle mower and it's no fun. It's gonna <laughs> say it doesn't work. Hmm. Yeah. When you when you what's your feeling on the tree or on the sergeants and the beans for the agronomy part of it and the people out of it? We like we think in our area, at times, it would get dry enough or raise the wrong time that we wouldn't get the yield locked. That was agronomical. It would suffer. And then sometimes the fall harvest can be a challenge. A couple of years, we got a frost. It got nice. And we got a frost and thought we were out. But it actually was fun. It, it crossed at the top six, eight inches, taking green underneath. We cut it, and it was perfect feet. But boy, timing had to be just about right. Otherwise, you could kind of, and it can go down. It can, it can with winds or a uh, fall rain or something, can take it down. And then it takes pretty good equipment to get it back. You can lose it. You get, get stressed over trying to get all this done. You get used to it. You get so that it's just fine. We're, we're old enough right now. Uh, yes. Yeah. But it and it but it takes good equipment too, and, and it makes you then. But you then you pay for that equipment by doing this. We get three crops in two years from the same dirt. Whoever thought that we would do that? You know, and save the soil to do the erosion. Yeah, and make the soil better in the end. What's your organic matter done in the last? 10 it, years it's before? up. It, it's good. We have the the better piece, and I, I'm going to test it again. But the better piece was over seven by the barn. By the seven, the water holding capacity. Yeah, yeah, it does. It acts like that. It's a real good piece of dirt. We always thought it was real good. The guy that sold us alfalfa wanted to test the soil just to follow it through, and we hadn't tested that as much as we should. So, 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 how did your fields perform in 2012 then when it was dry after you've been doing this for a while? It was better, better. We averaged 88 bushel of corn. Did and your neighbors get it? I don't know. I don't know whether we were good or bad, but, but that's what we averaged. You know, we fed the cows. That's what we do. I always tell the seed guy come, and, and he repeats it to me, and I said, I'm not buying seed curd. I, I, I'm planting feed. You know, this, I'm not looking at it. This is the end result is the feed that I eat out of it, not the, not the, the yield or, or so. I want the feed quality. When we look at this alfalfa, you know, where, like Jim said, I mean, this little minion. We're working to that so that we get the right feed quality out. We can get tons of alfalfa, but then we don't get any nutrition. 